Vaiguruji ka Khalsa, Vaiguruji ki Fateh. Today I've come to Wolverhampton, Her Majesty's um, Young Offenders Institute, to interview Charanjit Kaur. Let's go inside to the prison and see um, what she can explain to us about the prison services. I'm sort of, I, I'm born and bred in this country and I know English and I can help them and it's a case of if I can't help them they'll say well even if she can't do it she'll tell us who will be able to help us, who will be able to sign posters in the right direction. Charanjit, welcome Khalsa, Vaigurji Ki Khalsa, Vaigurji Ki Let's start by asking you a general question about giving us a profile um, about your life. Um, well, I've had a varied careers, all mainly in the public sector. Um, I've been in the prison service for 23 years now. Uh, started as an officer at Leeds Prison. Um, then I became a senior officer and moved to Moorlands, which is in Doncaster. And then from there, I put in for experience of sitting aboard at Birmingham Prison to get further promotion to, which is a principal officer rank, which is now no longer in existence, but is the highest, or was the highest unified rank at the time. Um, and the next day, I had a phone call to say, the job is yours. And it was like, because I lived in Bradford, thinking, Bradford, Birmingham, do I really want to move? You know, there's not much difference. But I made the choice. Um, I moved to Birmingham Prison as a principal officer. Um, and then did my governor's exams, um, and I was promoted at Birmingham as a, a governor. And that was in 2005. Right. What about your family life then? Um, family life, I, my, both my parents have passed away. I'm an only child, um, and I have two children. Um, I'm divorced, I'm a single mother. Um, my son Manpreet, who's 16, and my daughter Rosie, who's 12 and a half, going on 30. So you got all the teenage problems there. Uh, absolutely, teenage problems and <laughs> the sibling fighting. Rivalry, yes, yes. Um, so w did you always want to go into the prison or, you know, sector? No, or? no. Um, growing up, my, my ambition was always to be a nurse. You know, whenever people used to say to me, what do you want to do when you grow up? And it was, I want to be a nurse. So when I left school initially, I was left school at sort of 17 and a half and you couldn't start nurse training until you were 18. Um, I got a job as a secretary in um, an architect's office and as soon as I was 18 I managed to start my nurse training um, and I think I was, that was in 1980 which sounds years ago. Um, did my nurse training and qualified in 1982 and got a job in Bishop Stortford um, which is in Hertfordshire. Again, I wasn't looking for a career change because I was happy. I was doing the job that I always wanted to do. But um, at the time, the police force were having a bit of a recruitment drive in um, the Hertfordshire Police in Bishop Stortford and handing out leaflets. So a group of friends and I, we all took a leaflet. They all must have been theirs. I took it in. And for some reason, I just filled it in. I thought, I'll give it a go. Got called for an interview in the, by the police force and uh, joined them. Ended up joining the Hertfordshire Constabulary. And uh, I think I was one of their first Asian female police officers, so there was a big thing with the CRE in those days, you know, an Asian Sikh police officer joins Hertfordshire Constabulary, um, stayed in the police force for near enough five years. Um, and then my, my father was quite ill, he was diabetic, um, and being an unchild, I thought, right, okay, I need to go back home. Tried to get transfer, but I had a, because of bad back, I'd had an operation, so I couldn't get transfer because of the fitness test in the police force, so I went back into nursing. Um, and while I was working at Leeds General Infirmary one day, a group of prison officers from Leeds Prison, in fact four prison officers, came in with what was classed as a high-risk prison in those days to have some uh, NHS treatment. And I was talking to them and they were telling me about what they did. Um, it turned out they were what's known as healthcare officers, um, which are officers who have done the prison officer training but then worked specifically in the hospital wing of a prison. Um, a couple of them were nurse qualified and the other couple had been just done six months training and then the prison service were having a recruitment drive uh, at the job centre so again I thought okay I'll go find out about this perhaps as a nurse work in a prison 
which is what I did, and, and I joined in 2nd of January 1990, uh, was my first day of joining Leeds Prison. And again, I was the first Asian female officer to do training because I'd only started cross um, sex deployments at one stage, only male prisoners, uh, male prison officers worked at male establishments and female uh, officers worked at female establishments. But around that time, about 89, 90, they started having both sexes working in both establishments. And I was the first officer to do the training in a male establishment. Right. So again, in the Leeds Yorkshire Post, it was ethnic peacekeeper at Yorkshire Jail. <laughs> and um, the funny story about it, my mother cut this out and took it to our friend Meda, right. and it's on the mantelpiece, framed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> so every time I go home, yeah. it, it's there facing me, you know. <laughs> but let, let me ask you about, um, that was work for the prison itself then, mm -hmm. so um, from, from your nursing background. But nowadays, um, a, lot of, a lot of the stuff has been outsourced. I assume you don't have um, medical people now in prisons, do you? Is it all outsourced? No, we do have medical people. Um, and it's, it, the medical side of it is provided by the primary care trust now. So it depends whoever wins a tender for that region. So, yes, we have health care in prison, but it's not run by the prison service anymore. So the PCTs do it now? The PCTs do it. And it's not necessarily the local PCT. It's whoever bids and wins the bid or the wins a tender for that prison. Oh, I, I didn't realise that. I just thought PCTs were just, you know, for... No, they, they provide the health care in prisons as well. So has that happened with all prisons then, where a lot of the stuff is now, when you, when you joined, to now where they've, they've outsourced loads of things in terms of what about the education side? Yes, education here is provided by Milton Keynes College. Um, prior to them, it's Manchester College. Again, you know, they have tenders just like a business. So when their contract runs out, there'll be a contract put out people will tender for it, and it's whoever wins the bid will get the contract. Right. But you, you're, you are head of reducing re-offending. Can you explain what that actually means? Yeah, it's a bit of a mouthful, the title. But basically, my function is to assist the offenders when they're in prison to do certain activities, to gain qualifications, whether it's academic, whether it's basic literature, uh, literacy skills, numeracy skills, or even skills we do here, plastering, bricklaying, um, it's all MVQ based so that when they go out they have a job to go to because some of the reasons for offending are because they can't get work, you know, they need money so they'll commit crime. So it's giving them the tools to go out better equipped than they came in with perhaps. Is that, do you think that's effective then? Has it, I mean, the stats for people re-offending is, you know, people are always talking about, oh, people don't actually get any better when they leave prisons, they do re-offend. So do you... Uh, what do you I, think of I the think stats? There is, there is research, and I don't have the figures with me, but however, there is some impact. It's, it is minuscule at the moment, but, you know, um, oak trees don't grow overnight, so, you know, it's got to be a slow process. And I think as long as we are giving prisoners the tools to sort of better themselves, if you like, whatever their shortcomings are whilst they're in custody, as opposed to just leaving them behind the cell doors without anything, it's got to be better. So let's talk about um, the Sikhs that are in this, this prison. So um, number-wise, how, how many Sikhs are actually here? Or We've classified only, as Sikhs? Uh, Sikhs, uh, six. We've only got six Sikh prisoners in the prison. Six? Yeah. Are they all male? Yes, it's a male establishment. We don't have mixed prisons. So if it's a male establishment, it will just be male prisoners. Right. So okay. here it's young offenders aged 18 to 21. Um, uh, we can take up to 577, but today our population is 524. So what, overall, in the whole of the UK, what, what, how many prisons, or in terms of how many, can it actually, all, all the prisons put together, is there a number for this or not? Uh, there's 140 prisons in right. the UK. 140? 140. So are there stats based upon ethnicity then? When we talk about Asikandeya, or is it based on Indians, or is it based no, it's, on... No, it's, it's, the stats are, can be broken down sort of into ethnicity, but religious-wise, I think, in the prison population, I think there's about 80,000, or 84,000 today, a snapshot figure would be in the prison system, and out of them, there's about 750 who we would class as Sikh prisoners. So it's quite a low percentage for Sikhs, then? About 1% of the prison population. What, uh, I mean, the, the prison here with the, with the six offenders, then, do I mean have you had repeat offenders? I assume more people that keep coming back. Um, because, uh, what a, um, the reason I ask you that question is, 
What are people that are going to be deported? Do they come into prison as well here? Some do. Um, some do. Um, I'm not sure about here at the moment with the Sikh population, but yes, we do have detainees as well. So they will do initially a prison sentence. So it's once they've completed that sentence, if they've been served with a deportation order, then we will keep them in custody until at such time that the UKBA, or the Home Office as it is now, um, come and collect him and take him to the immigration center, which is usually just one or two days before they're going to get flown back to the country of origin. Right. It's quite low percentages, isn't it, for Sikhs, I think, overall. I mean, I mean, I mean you can't really be proud of anybody going to prison, but in terms of stats, what, what you've just said to me is it's pretty low for Sikhs. It is. It is, you know... Um, I don't, is that a, we're law-abiding people? I don't know. But we are, we are uh, very, very low numbers. And that's always been the case ever since, like I said, I've been in the service 23 years. And I think it's more or less stayed the same right through. When we entered, there was a gentleman who was um, uh, doing chaplain work. What do you think of that for, um, for Sikhs? Do, they, is, is, do you think it's a good idea where they come in and try to teach them I don't know, stories or part or listen to them and so on? I think it's important for every faith to have some sort of pastoral care. Um, and just because out in the community they don't go to the Gurdwaras, uh, that doesn't mean they, don't, they won't gain anything spiritually. So here it is a captive audience. And I suppose one of the reasons they do like going to the Sikh service is because if they're not engaged in any activity, it gives them time out their cell as well. So they can go meet their other you know, friends if they know them, because generally they will know each other. So that two hours is where the, the Gyanji can give them some sort of spiritual guidance, um, fatherly guidance as well, I think, you know, about, okay, you're here now, but make sure that this is your last visit or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and some of them don't even speak Punjabi. So the, um, our Gyanji, he, you know, his English is quite reasonable, so he can com communicate with them in English. But they do enjoy it, and certainly when it's Vasaki and when we have the Langar and the congregational meal, so you tend to get quite a good turnout for that day, if not for the, all the other sessions. Right. The work that you're doing, I mean, it seems to me that people in the community would probably come to your home and say, well, oh, we'll go and ask Jadanjeet about this, but other problems have got nothing to do with actually being a governor of, um, of, of the prison. So do you get lots of um, Sikhs coming and knocking on your door? No, I don't get them knocking, but usually because then I'm sort of... I, I'm born and bred in this country and I know English and I can help them and it's a case of if I can't help them they'll say well even if she can't do it she'll tell us who will be able to help us who will be able to sign posters in the right direction um, I think you know but if people when they know I'm in the prison service and if they are ever know somebody and they don't know how the system works they do I have known people sort of ring and say look we don't know how to get a visit can you help us so it, it does work I do want to talk about one, one other point that somebody had mentioned. There is a difference between the police and the prison. And there's some confusion about it's the same group. That's not the case, is it? No. Two different organisations, similar uniforms, but that's where it ends. Right. Um, and basically, the police arrest and deal with them in the community. So they'll arrest them, get them charged, produce them in court. And then the magistrate or the Crown Court will sentence them or remand them in custody. Then they will come to a prison. And then from that point on, then we look after them. The, the prisons, that was something I forgot to ask you, is there are private prisons, which I didn't realise until I was um, you know, talking to yourself. So how, how, I mean, are you sort of competing with each other? No, no, it's not competing. Each prison has got a different function. You know, we have different categories of prisons. You've got local prisons, which take anybody from court. Um, then you've got the cat sea trainers, as we call them. So they're for prisoners who are sentenced, doing relatively sort of long sentence, if you like with training facilities in there to give them jobs when they get out. Um, young offender institutes, female estate, but the, the private sector could be doing any or all of those functions. Um, right. There are 14 um, private prisons doing a various sort of different prisons, so there's no competition as such. It's just a case of, at that time, they were, those prisons were up for what's known as a market test. Again, a bid system. Um, the prison service would have bid as well. To, right. to keep, to run that prison. And it's whoever bid was the most, not necessarily cost effective, but could deliver the best value for money and with the best outcomes, they got the tenders and they won, they won the contracts. I mean, you, you're the head of um, the department that you work for. Do you think, um, you know, what is the hierarchy? Are you looking to become, you know, the top person in, in a prison? How does that work? No, there is a hierarchy. Um, it's, 
very streamlined now. At one stage, it was much, you know, there was many more layers of management. Whereas now there's, I'm a band seven, there's band eight, and above that you get to what's a governing governor job and basically you're in charge of the prison at that stage. Um, to get to that, you have to do further exams. Um, and I keep thinking at the moment, my kids, I've got to get them through university, I'll just keep carrying on with what I'm doing. Right. So, you, so the, the role that you've taken, you're not, I mean, I, I assume that that role, is that in every prison? Yes. Every, every establishment will okay. have the same sort of structure. Right. Um, some prisons which are classed as more low, you know, the, the busy local prisons, they might be as a complex, they might have more senior managers, which is what my, my rank is, basic class as a senior management team member. Um, they may have a few more of my rank and perhaps one above me, um, but otherwise everywhere is more or less the same, so it's a case of the structure will be the same whichever prison you're working at. Right. So let's talk about the community outside then. Um, I mean, is there uh, any particular Gurdwara that you're affiliated to or you help in or do you stay away from Gurdwaras? No, no, um, I, I do go to Gurdwara at the moment. I'm in Birmingham, I go to mainly Soho Road, the main Gurdwara there. Um, when I was in Bradford, uh, my uncle is um, a secretary at the temple there, um, Singh Sawa Gurdwara. So in Bradford, that was the main one we went to as a family. Right. Um, so you, you think that the Gurdwaras play a vital role in, um, in the community in terms of you know, putting them into a certain direction? I think they do. Um, however, I suppose it, it depends. You know, I, I used to drag my children to Punjabi school, um, but I've given up the fight, I think, because it is such sometimes you know, you're dragging the kids and if they're not learning and they're going under you know, force, I almost think it's better that they go with me to, they'll say to me, we'll go to Mathatik, we'll have Langar and we'll see, but I'm not going to Punjabi school. So I'm thinking, you know, it's a case of, okay, I'd rather they went and understood why we're going and whatnot, as opposed to making, forcing them to go somewhere where they don't want to be. Um, the good thing is that they do have, but I think sometimes they need to reach out to the diff younger generation in perhaps a different way, um, that the, commun you know, the youngsters understand. Right. I mean, the reason I asked you that question was because there's obviously a skill set that you, that you possess. And so I don't know why the Gurdwara wouldn't use that skill set that you have. Reaching mm. out to the children is one thing. They need to reach out to community members like yourself and saying, oh, this is a skill set that you have. We think that we could use that skill set that you're doing here. Mm. Um, th th that's the role that I was looking for. Yeah. Um, whether people, you know, why the Gurdwara wouldn't be doing that. Well, it's, it's something that at the moment in the West Midlands that we're looking at reducing reoffending is a big, big thing you know, with the government agenda about rehabilitation. Um, and I sort of said, look, we need to get our community involved in the, sort of, the resettlement agenda, if you like, because as you say, they don't know about it. And it's almost a taboo subject. You know, if, if a child is in prison, it's a case of Indian Giaya, Bande Giaya, because they don't want to say where they are. Um, so I think it would be good for them to, and vice versa, you know, I could share my experiences and how they can get involved. Uh, we need to have our youngsters and our adult prisoners not reoffending, so that instead of just sort of disowning them, perhaps, in, which does happen in some cases, you know, I'll, I'll talk to Sikh prisoners and they'll say, family don't want to know because they're embarrassed, they're ashamed of me, and they've said basically, go away, we don't want to know. Well, if he hasn't, our people, if we're not going to help and support him, then where else is he going to go? Then he's going to just carry on doing what he did to get him into prison in the first place. Yes, I mean, you know, I've always had this view about Gurdwaras, um, that we should actually be looking at the community and issues that we have and not, you know, hiding from them. For example, if our children are suffering from alcoholism, we need to have classes in Gurdwaras about trying to help them. Yeah. Not disowning them. That's the wrong thing. Yeah. And, I, and I'm hoping that that's going to change with the next generation that's coming. Because at the moment, tolerable. sorry interrupting, but the good thing is, you know, if you're drunk, he could be an alcoholic. Yes, and they don't but, seem to... But it's okay, right, you know, the neon of the scene. Yes. You're drunk. No, I, I agree. I think there are, we have to have certain rules uh, about, you know, inviting people who are, for example, alcoholic, but there should be facilities. I'm not yes. saying they come into the Darbar. No, so. no, absolutely yeah, not. Nobody would say that. So, mm. um, no, that's one thing that, um, and it's the same thing with the drugs, it's the same thing with, you know, if someone's having family issues, they should be able to go somewhere rather than looking for, um, you know, leaving our faith in, in many ways. Yeah. Uh, or even this thing, you know, I mean, mm. I'm not... It, in favor of that. Um, no, and that's, that's quite heavy stuff. Uh, I, I was quite interested about your comment about taking children to the learning Punjabi and they don't want to go. At least you didn't say, okay, there's a Gurdwara now, because I'm no. convinced that if you take your children at a young age, 
they will remember 20 years time, 30 years time, oh yes, our mother did this with us. Mm. If you never do it, they will never grow up. That's to right, that. yeah. You know, no, we, every Sunday, when I'm, when I'm, <laughs> as if I'm not work, if I'm out of work, a Sunday is a good Wara day. <laughs> well, that's good. I think we should all do that. Mm. Um, Let's talk about some, I mean, with all the work you're doing, um, I assume you've got nothing for in terms of your own hobbies and things that you like doing. I mean, do you have any other time to do anything else? I, I enjoy sort of theatre, cinema, reading, um, but usually, like I said, taxis for my son, cricket <laughs> matches and cricket <laughs> practice, um, and just family things, basically. Right. Um, but I, you know, I'm not affiliated to any charity. Um, and usually exhausted by the time I get home from here. Because we do duty governors as well. I mean, on Monday night I was here, I didn't get home until 10 o'clock. So I left here about 10 past 9, 20 past 9. Then I had to hit Asda, um, because <laughs> my daughter was in there's no bread at home for sandwiches in the morning. So, you know, it, it's a long day. Um, I mean, talking about your day then, because I know you're on duty today as well. So, I mean, just go through a, a simple day, or if, if it is simple. I mean, do, um, the sort of thing that happens in a, in, in a prison. On a morning, we'll come in, and the governor will have a, uh, what's known as his morning operational meeting. And that's usually the, all the senior, uh, or senior managers will go to that meeting, along with our custodial managers. And they will report on the day before what's happened, any incidents, and report them back to the governor. Um, then we'll sort of filter off, and if you happen to be the duty governor, um, and then you will basically, any incidents, you are running the prison that day for the governor. Right. So any incident that happens, you will deal with it, and unless it's major, you'll deal with it. If it's big, you'll bring the governor and say, right, this is happening, this is what I'm doing, so that he's aware what's happening in this establishment. Um, basically, you have to stay here until the night uh, role is correct, so that anybody who's in court who's coming back to us is in, you know, here we have to stay up and to accept them back from court. And uh, like I said, on Monday it's 10 past 9. Right. Um, some days, if we're lucky, it'll be half past 7. Um, but, you know, we, we've got a young clientele. Um, sometimes they'll fight, you know, amongst each other. Um, so you just to report to the incidents, make sure that everybody's all right, the prisoners are okay, then make sure the staff are okay. Um, and make sure that the prisoners are getting to where they're supposed to be, i.e. education, or if they're supposed to be in education, they're not skiving off and getting to the gym. That would seem to be a good one, because they prefer going to the gym and coming to education. Um, our policy is that we want them to be engaged in activities. So whether that's education or whether that's uh, MVQ skills, you know, like plastering, bricklaying, um, they would rather sit in, the TV, you know, sit in the cell or go to the gym. Right. Because they'll say, well, we didn't go to school when we were out there. What makes you think I'm going to go to school in here? <laughs> um, so it's, it's quite a difficult challenge trying to motivate the prisoners to go into these activities. Um, so making sure the staff get them geared up and get to if where they If they do offend in the prison, I mean, surely they don't go out, do they? Do, do, is, some, is, is, is some sort of sentence passed here within the Yeah, yeah. Um, depending on the, what the offence is, um, when I first joined the prison service, the governor could give them what's known as additional days. Um, down the road now, we, we, we can't give them any time, extra time in prison, but we have a judge coming in. So he will then give them extra days. So if their sentence is six months, if they've done damage in here, the judge can actually give them another 14, 21, 28 days or whatever, depending on the offence. For me, if I'm the adjudicator, which is what we call ourselves, if we're doing it for minor crimes, depending on what he's done, I will give them sometimes, can't go to the gym, I'll take the TV off them, um, stop their earnings because they earn money. So you'll say, right, 50% of your earnings, I, we're not going to give you, but you're still going to have to go to education or wherever they're going to go. Um, you're not going to be able to buy a canteen, so they're not going to be able to buy as much from the prison shop it is. Canteen is the other word for prison shop. Right. Um, so those are, and that's some, an association, which is another one, because they like to come out and see the mates. And if you stop, say, right, for 14 days, you're not going to come out for association. You can have your showers, you can have your phone calls, and anything else like that. Um, but, you know, you won't be coming out to do association. You're not going to spend as much money as you want to. Um, so we do those sort of awards internally. Right, so the, the privileges that they have, so you can take away some of those privileges in order yes. to, if you, if you can offend on the same things, or, yeah. so have you, there's not been any major riots, like, you know, some of the... Touch Touching wood. <laughs> no. Uh, no. I shouldn't have jinxed you there. No, no. But, uh, no, no, we don't want riots, but I mean, um, you know, um, there, there, obviously there are, there are issues sometimes in prisons where you hear about from outside. Does the... Um, the media come in or not to make sure that uh, people aren't being, uh, you know, taken advantage of and this sort of stuff. How does that work? No, we don't have the media coming in. We have an organisation called the Independent Monitoring Board, and I'll actually take the opportunity to say, you know, Sikhs are very, very underrepresented 
um, on the Independent Monetary Board, and they are an external sort of body, if you like, um, appointed by the Minister um, right. to make sure that prisoners are getting treated fairly, that we're not, you know, prisoners aren't getting beaten up, that they are getting what they, did, what they need, that all the requirements are met, basically, and they can come in any time of the day or night. So, you know, the prisoners so that's use like, them. So that's like the Independent Police Commission. You have, is it similar to that, where... Very, very vaguely, but these are just volunteers who do it oh, in their okay. own time. Right. And they will come in and visit prisoners. And the prisoner will put an application, I want to see an IMB. Right. Um, basically, if, if an officer, if he sees me and I, he doesn't like the answer I give him, he'll say, I won't, I, I want to see the IMB. And so the next time the IMB is in, he or she will go see them and they'll say, well, Governor Miat said, I can't have this. Can you do anything about it? And nine times out of ten, they'll say, well, no, she's probably said it for a reason, because right. she's entitled to it. But they are an independent sort of scrutiny panel, is probably the, the appropriate word to use for them. Okay, no, I, I didn't know that. That, that, that. That's interesting. It's a bit, a bit different as well in terms of how... And it would be uh, good if, you know, every single prison has an IMB, you know, Independent Monitoring Board I think most membership. Would, right, and, and you can just apply for it, can you? You apply to it, yeah. Um, and they're always, always wanting volunteers to come on board. Surely you must have a certain background. You can't just automatically... They, they do. You know, obviously there's criminal checks and that. Right, right. Um, apart from that, you know, I mean, usually most of them are retired sort of teachers and, you know, ex the, the professional people. Right. Um, but who just want to do something different and a bit more challenging with their spare time, I suppose. Yes, yeah, so we should encourage some Sikhs to do that yeah. if we can. I don't think most people know. But that, I think we should um, maybe do a programme on that. Mm. That would be interesting. Um, Okay, we're nearly, we've only got five minutes left now. Let me, um, is, is there anything else um, that, that you wanted to share with us, um, you know, with the Sikh channel viewers? No, um, I would just say, you know, like I've been in prison service since 23 years, um, and it's a career, and I don't think it's, the prison service isn't something that everybody looks at as a career. Um, we've now, we are getting graduate entries coming in, because obviously at universities, they'll look at the schemes that are available out there for people to come in. Um, I've had a very enjoyable sort of career in the service. I think uh, my first experience, however, at Leeds, I, I was strangled. And I remember I was taken home and my mum said, You know, I was And that was a guy who was, he was very unwell, mentally unwell. He was in the hospital wing and that's where I was working at the time. Right. Um, and I often think about it, you know, I thought, God, if she hadn't let me go back, you know, <laughs> who knows what I'd have been doing. But uh, interesting times and it's my fifth prison. So I've enjoyed a variety of uh, prisons and areas, uh, worked with the female estate. Um, I, and there's even Sikh females, um, you know, unfortunately now, you know, it's not just Sikh men that are in prison. We have got Sikh girls and Sikh women in prison. But, they, but they would be in women prisons? Yes, they're in women's prisons. So would you encourage Sikh women to take sort of the roles that you were doing in the early days? Or do you think people still have that myth, like you're strangling incident and so on? But that's it. I would still say, you know, it, that's a one incident out of, you know, so many 23 years I can probably count on one hand where right. okay. physically, you know, anybody's got anywhere near me. And, nine ta and even in that incident, it was a prisoner that got the guy off me. Oh, so, right, you know, okay. And the okay. prisoners have a, re a certain amount of respect for women. You know, they, they still have this moral, you know, she's a fit woman, we're not going to do this to her. And some obviously don't, but majority-wise, they still have this respect for women officers and staff. Um, but no, I would say it's, it's a good career if you fancy it. Um, and we should. Um, we, yes, we are only 1%, but we need to have both sides of the door, you know, representation. No, I think it's, um, I think the work you're doing is commendable. I think it's, it's fascinating. It's, it's very busy, obviously, with your schedule and so on. But um, I do want to say, you know, thank you for allowing us to come to the prison. It's our first Sikh spectrum in a prison. Um, you know, we've been to hospitals, we've been to the education sector. We've, we only thought about this um, when your name came up. And I said, oh, yes, we should go to a prison. So, and it happened to be in Wolverhampton. <laughs> so um, no, I, I want to thank you for allowing Sikh Channel to come to the prison and sharing some of your, your experiences with that. Thank you. Why would you call us? Why would you keep